All right, intelligence. Um, what do you think intelligence is? Um, a lot of people don't know what intelligence is, um, but they hear it all the time. Oh, that person's really intelligent. I like to start by asking you, who's the most intelligent person you know? So I'll sit here and I'll wait for the students. If I was in lecture to tell me who's the most intelligent person they know. And inevitably, what ends up coming up is that it has something to do with people in their family. And uh, I find that interesting. Oftentimes, it's older people. It's people who are, say, their grandparents or, um, you know, their parents, aunts and uncles. Almost never do I hear, it's my younger sister. She's the smartest person I know. Almost never. And so when people say that, they also mix up intelligence with being smart. Smart is a general term that we use, but intelligence actually means a description of somebody's innate, right? So it's, it's, um, it's not something that you earned through uh, working hard or a personality characteristic. It's something that you're born with. And in fact, we'll see that it's really a genetic predisposition towards your innate ability to solve problems. Um, there are other elements that make people consistently good problem solvers, but intelligence is the main one. Uh, there are others that probably have more variability in whether or not problems get solved. Uh, I am not some super genius, but I work harder than everybody else. And that is a real reason why I've succeeded in my life. It's not because I'm some sort of a Mensa, you know, super genius person. I think I probably am measured less IQ than other people. I know my brother, uh, when he was young, he was having problems in school and they took him to the doctor and he had a, a higher IQ than uh, he had such a high IQ. He got to go into like special programming. Uh, he was struggling in school because he was bored. I, I liked school. I'm still here, <laughs> even when we're distance learning. I haven't left yet. Turns out if you keep going to school, they'll eventually start paying you to be there. So I, I've loved school, and, and he didn't. He didn't like it because it was boring for him. He needed more stimulation. He was more intelligent. He needed bigger problems to solve. Um, but I worked harder. And that, I really believe, is why I have had outcomes that are so successful in my life, not some sort of thing that I'm the most intelligent person. So if you find yourself on any place on that spectrum, if you find yourself super intelligent, you're on this end of the curve, we'll talk about the bell curve in a second, you gotta be careful because being that smart comes with a lot of responsibilities and a lot of pitfalls. If you're the average person and you know that about yourself, you're right in the middle, you're just like everybody else in terms of problem solving, how are you going to distinguish, distinguish yourself from everybody else if you're average? If you're on the low end of the curve, if you're somebody who doesn't innately solve problems or, or think well, or, or you don't learn well from your experiences as well as everybody else, how are you going to exceed? How are you going to get through and progress in this life? And the answer to all three of those is really you put your nose to the grindstone and you outwork your competitors, the people on your left, the people on your right. You do more. You be willing to sacrifice more. The more you sacrifice, the higher your success will be, regardless of where you are on this innate spectrum. Okay, there's variability. People come with different abilities to think through problems, to learn from their experiences, to solve problems. But a, you don't have a choice, right? This is an immutable characteristic. You don't have a choice how intelligent you are. It just is what it is. You do have a choice with how hard you work. So remember that hard work is going to be your ticket to improving your life, to making yourself thrive, not some innate immutable characteristic that's not your fault. The amount of work you put in is going to change things. All right. Let's talk about the history behind intelligence testing. All right. The history of intelligence as a part of psychology. <clears throat> goes way back. Um, I'm going to have to explain something that we use a lot in intelligence research, and that's the normal curve. So really briefly, 
LaPace found a double exponential graph that's named after him. It's a probability distribution that basically looks like a tent with a tent pole pitching a tent. Later on in the 1800s, piggybacking off of LaPace's work, Gauss, a German mathematician, used a continuous probability distribution to form what we now know of as the normal curve or the bell curve. That is that it's got a probability density below it, so it's really helpful for large populations to be able to predict um, within that. It's a statistically helpful thing. Many people are upset about the normal curve and intelligence overall, but I, I wanna I want to divorce today's critiques of those who went before us and their foibles and their errors, and I want to focus on what they gave us that's helpful and beneficial. Turns out there were a bunch of bigoted, sexist, racist people in the past, and they did bad things and they had bad ideas. But it also turns out that however woke we are right now, however much we think we are being considerate of all, kind, compassionate, truly treating each other as equals now, just wait until our great, great, great grandkids come back and start looking at us, seeing how we've done things. So be careful about how you criticize those who lived in a different context than you in history. The idea of measuring intelligence had been bantered about a lot, but intelligence testing didn't really get its start until Alfred Binet and Theodore Simon in France were, were commissioned to assess the capabilities for learning of French school children. Um, French school children had uh, never been educated by the government and the government was going to educate them all. The problem is, is that the government knew that it couldn't educate everybody with the limited amount of resources it had, so it had to determine who was who qualified to be best benefit from instruction? And they needed a, a, a sorting hat, sort of, sort of like Hogwarts, right? You had to put this sorting hat on the children to see to which public education system would they go. Um, you might be unfamiliar with this, or you might think that it's a terrible thing to do, but this is still practiced in Europe today where people will take standardized tests and that will give them options for how they pursue public free education. Here in the United States, you could fail out of high school, um, never graduate, and then go to a community college for free if you were financially in need of it, perform well at that college, and be admitted to Stanford, Harvard, UCLA, and graduate from there summa cum laude, go on to a prof professional career, or move into any of the um, graduate study programs, you could start off really bad and make it. Not a lot of people do. Very, very few people ever get to a position where they can take advantage of the system that we have set up here. In fact, the European system of education probably benefits more people, but we in America like our story of those who can pull themselves up by their bootstraps and effectively change their lives. We like that legend, that myth, that narrative. That's very American. Alfred Binet and Theodore Simon, however, wanted to classify children with their capacity to learn so that you could put kids in highly um, fast-paced learning environments or in very slow-paced ones where there was less expected in terms of outcomes in the same amount of time put in. They developed a test that was the first intelligence test really used. And the French government used it to figure out which children should go to which schools. So, there's that. The army then used a, a modification of it when they had to onboard tons and tons of men in World War I. It's called the Army Alpha and Beta Tests. They tested these people and basically found whether or not they were capable to do complex cognitive work this was uh, its first use in mass in the United States, was the Army Alpha and Beta test. 
Later, the Stanford Binet test, so it was Alfred Binet's ideas done at Stanford, uh, they developed a test for children in the United States and adapted it for adults. And they learned from the past mistakes uh, and it was um, a greatly improved psychometric tool. The Stanford Binet test later was usurped, later was taken over by the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale as the, the premier or the most widely used and accepted form of a standardized test of intelligence. If you have not taken the, I think it's in its fourth edition now, the WACE 4, maybe it's third still. No, I think it's four. Yeah, it's four and not fifth. They don't have the fifth one yet. Um, the WACE is the just gold standard for intelligence tests now. It has uh, a system where it breaks down intelligence into multiple subcategories saying that intelligence isn't one particular concept, but a conglomerate of many different propensities and abilities that people have. That debate over whether your intelligence is one thing or many things has raged on from Spearman to Gardner. Now, Spearman was a, a mathematician, and he described this idea of an innate learning ability that governed all different aspects of learning. So let's say I was trying to learn how to... Um, you know, float concrete well. I'm trying to learn how to do that. Don't know how to do that. How do I float concrete? My propensity to learn that particular skill set based on my general intelligence would put me in a certain position amongst other people. But what if I was learning to uh, sing opera? My ability to learn to sing opera would benefit by my particular general intelligence or detract my ability to learn would be detracted by my general intelligence commiserate with me learning to float concrete or learning to code or build robots or do surgery. Anything that I could learn, I could learn at the pace that was governed by my general intelligence. That is Spearman's theory of intelligence. That seems pretty harsh. It's like people are born with an innate characteristic that that's how well they learn. And uh, Gardner came along. Um, he was in like the, the era after the civil rights movement. Howard Gardner, wonderful man, totally wrong. He had an idea of how to create an, this story about intelligence saying that because we were seeing differences in intelligences in malign minority groups, specifically black inner city folks, what we were to do was to actually destroy Spearman's work that identified that people come with the general intelligence and then blow that up and then say, oh, well, see, you're not good at learning in schools, little kids. Maybe you're really musically gifted, right? You're, or maybe you're kinesthetically intelligent. Maybe you're spatially intelligent or maybe you're interpersonally intelligent. He was measuring different, what he called frames of mind. The, his classic list was uh, logical, mathematical, uh, linguistic, musical, spatial, body kinesthetic, interpersonal, and intrapersonal. I think that's it. The problem is, is that there's no research that supports Howard Gardner's work and Spearman's work saying that we have a general ability. Given a certain amount of time, we can develop whatever uh, skill set uh, is actually supported by research. If you've read any of Malcolm Gladwell's work about 10,000 hours to become an expert at anything, it turns out that I am not a cellist like Yo-Yo Ma is because Yo-Yo Ma spent tens of thousands of hours perfecting his craft. I did not. I don't believe I've ever touched a cello. Does that mean I could never play a cello or that he's so much more musically gifted than me? Gifted is like a gift you've been given. You didn't, you didn't earn it. Yo-Yo Ma earned that. And his general level of intelligence, probably being very high, also aided him in learning that. So the time he spent, if, I, if he was a normal person like me, and I spent the same amount of time as Yo-Yo Ma practicing a cello, he'd probably still be better if he had a higher level of general intelligence. But again, like I told you before, I, would ha I could get to his performance levels, I would have to work harder. This is not something that people really want to think about 
but the reality is is that we have differences in our abilities to think it uh, and, and to learn to learn quickly from our experiences some of us learn well from our experiences and some of us don't learn well from our experiences Gardner wasn't wrong in that there are some people who are interpersonally intrapersonally body kinesthetic you know think LeBron James right he's six foot eight 280 pounds of raw muscle and he spent his entire adult life even his young adult life honing his craft of basketball now if you had somebody else who was that same size say uh, same musculature same physical abilities and they spent the same amount of time doing it i believe they'd be as good as lebron but i don't think anybody spends as much time doing it i know there's a bunch of other six foot eight 280 pound shredded athletes in the nba who don't work as hard as lebron james and i don't think that that means that he's more intelligent than them i think it means that he works harder than them i think his general level of intelligence also like yo yo ma is very high to be that level of success i'm guessing you have to be that intelligent americans don't like that either that there are people who are less intelligent than you or less intelligent than you because oftentimes, well, frankly, historically, there have been cases where governments, even the German government, was um, allowing for eugenics to be practiced or the forced sterilization in the United States of people who had mental retardation. Mental retardation is the term that we used to describe people with low levels of ability to learn. And, and that's not okay. You see, we're perfecting the ideals that we have about people we're perfecting them they're not perfect yet but we have this ideal that all men are created equal right martin luther king jr reminded us that once we start treating people based on the content of their character uh, that we will be realizing that dream but we don't do that quite yet we do a lot better than we once did it used to be that people were maligning folks that had mental retardation saying that they were less valuable as humans and while they are not good at learning from their own experiences they will struggle in school they will not be able to hold a job like a normal adult their value functionally as a human should be uh, uh, never challenged they are worthy and dignified as humans in fact our entire country is based upon perfecting that idea that each individual is a sovereign that we should look into them and we should see the uh, the imago dei the buddha inside for those of you from eastern religions but this is something that's very fundamentally true every person is equal on their value as a human they should be treated justly under the law equally that does not mean that every person is capable of learning the same, nor does it mean that people groups are equal in their ability to learn. We conflate equality with everybody should be the same, but you don't want everybody to be the same. You don't want everybody to have the same abilities. Life would be extremely boring and diversity would be nullified, right? We don't want to eliminate diversity, we should celebrate it. And that includes celebrating people have different cognitive skill sets. For example, my brother, is extremely good at learning languages. He's very good at learning languages. I wish I was as good at learning languages as he is, but remember, he's more intelligent than I. So I, if I wanna get as good at languages as he is, I have to put in the time. It turns out I don't, so guess who's better at languages? He is. I put my time into other things. I invest in myself in developing who I am in different ways. And that has to do with my personality and my experiences and my context but my general level of intelligence also implies that I will have less return on my learning investment than someone who is more intelligent than I. I'm not upset by that because I really like that there are Elon Musks out there. I really like that there are people who are so extreme, like the LeBron James and the, and the Yo-Yo Ma's that are so intelligent that when they apply themselves to a particular problem set and they put their 10,000 hours in, they get insanely good results. I like that. I don't think you want that to be equal. I don't think you want everybody in the world to have 100 IQ.
Sorry. When we think about intelligence differences, you also need to recognize something else. People don't have the same context. They don't start from the same place. They weren't given the same opportunities. And those contexts and opportunities gained or lost do change their scores on particular IQ tests. But let's say that an IQ test, the Wexler Adults Intelligence Scale, the Stanford Binet, or some one that you took on IQtest.com or 123testiq.com, let's say that they don't perfectly measure your intelligence ability. Let's say that they, their construct validity or how much they measure of that particular concept, that construct of intelligence, is let's say it's like 92%. So they miss some level of intelligence. Still, what we see in all of these tests is that there's a wide variety. You may have taken tests when you were in school that tried to determine your intelligence. But some of the critiques of these early intelligence tests were that we have disproportionate scores in different communities. That gender and ethnicity played a part or a role in how people scored on these tests. Now, that makes people uncomfortable. But I'm here to tell you an, an actual test fact about intelligence tests. Females score higher than males on average on IQ scores. Is that sexist? No, I'm not saying that females are more valuable than males. I'm not saying that they should be given opportunities and males should not be. I'm saying nothing of the sort. I'm literally stating that females score higher on average than males on intelligence tests. Now, I could leave it at that. And you might be like, yeah, go women. Or I could explain more of the subtleties of distributions of IQs and show you that in fact, while the average female scores higher than the average male in general, the curves have different distributions such that males have more of a platocritic distribution. That means that it's got more diversity and more broad spread out of IQ. It means, it means that basically there's more uh, geniuses and more dullards in males. Whereas the female curve tends to be flatter. So there's less dullards, and we used to call them imbeciles or idiots. These are all words that were described for people that had low IQ level. We call those things, uh, you know, retarded and, and idiot and imbecile and feeble-minded and all these words, people then used to describe other people as lesser throughout history. And so we've had to change again and again. When I grew up, People that scored below a 70 IQ and had functional impairments in their life, we labeled them as mentally retarded, mild, moderate, and severe, right? So there's levels of it. But because also my generation called each other, you're retarded, that's retarded, just like they would say, that's gay, right? What they were doing is using words to demean, but those words actually had a real meaning which described a particular person, gay being a homosexual, uh, whereas mild or moderate or severe mental retardation talked about someone's intellectual abilities. We've changed the way that we now describe them. So now uh, somebody who has a cognitive impairment that makes them have IQ of 70 or less and they are um, uh, impaired in their some form of functioning, we call them intellectually disabled or ID, intellectually disabled. I get upset when both sides if, if somebody says yeah we should we should not have people that have low iqs around and those people are idiots or imbeciles or retarded that has an animus in your heart where you're not respecting their like i said before their equality under our set of our system of values is that each individual is dignified and valuable if you start saying that they because they have a difference in their intellectual ability you are you're judging them based on an immutable characteristic of them that's bigoted it's like racism and sexism, right? Intellectualism is what that is. But I don't think that that's necessarily a reason to forget about intelligence tests or see that we shouldn't look at them or treat them as something that's a useful understanding of people's innate learning capacities. And similarly, I don't think that we should say malign um, the fact that there are differences in groups of people. I find that very interesting. I don't think it's uninteresting. My professor, Dr. Thomas Parham, who is a world-renowned black psychologist, told a story in our class when I was at UC Irvine and he, he described it like this. Imagine 
that there is in the 1960s when the Stanford Binet comes out, there's an intelligence test question and it says, uh, three birds sitting on a fence. There's a fence. Can you see that fence out there? There you go. Oh. Three birds are sitting on a fence. Right, so. One, two, three. And a little boy comes by and throws a rock and hits one down. How many birds are left on the fence? Y you would be best to answer that there were two birds left on the fence because you understand that this is a real math question, right? This is not a question about a real fence and real birds, but this is an intelligence test question. And so you're meant to say that three birds take away one, it's two birds left. That's how that question's set up. If you've been in school all your life, you've been acculturated to this level of stories for math problems. But let's say that you haven't been given all those opportunities. Let's say that because of whatever circumstances you've got in your life, uh, there's two little boys. And let's say one little boy is uh, a black boy in the inner city. And he's being raised by his grandmother. His parents have been imprisoned. She's very poor, his grandmother's very poor. He lives in public housing. There's not a good school in his district. He goes to a school where he's scared all the time. The teachers don't care. They're threatened by their administrations for not raising the scores of the students. He is taught to the test and, and never actually taught the functional components of what he's learning. He's scared all the time. He's hungry. And he goes to take that test. Now this kid who's been neglected, been out on the streets, understood that when little boys throw rocks at things, birds, animals react. What does he answer? How many birds are left on that fence when you throw a rock and hit one of the three birds down? There are no birds left on a fence. If you throw a rock and hit a bird off of the fence, the other birds and their survival instincts will scatter. Now, who's smarter? The little boy raised in an uh, affluent community that uh, has all the advantages, uh, loving, stay-at-home parent, stay-at-home mom, a successful professional father, great, nice, kind siblings, uh, good neighborhood opportunities for expansion, um, socialization and learning at a good school with teachers who are innovative and care. How's he going to answer that question? He's going to know that the answer is two because he's been acculturated to understand that the question that's being asked is about math, not about birds. Dr. Parham really got through to me about that is that we have to be careful with what we're testing. Now, is an intelligence test racially biased because little Johnny from the hood and little Johnny from the hills score differently on that test? It depends on your perspective. Currently, everybody's telling you that every time you see racial disparities or differences in ethnic peoples, that that's somehow a result of some boogeyman named structural racism. Unfortunately, what that does is it make us not address any of the issues that could solve that difference, that could change the scores on those tests. We aren't actually addressing issues that are making little Johnny worse at a particular test or making little Johnny better at a particular test because we're not addressing that there are different contexts in which they're raised. Now, context doesn't mean your destiny. Whenever you Whenever you hear people complaining about a single thing, let's say intelligence, intelligence tests are bias. Okay. What should we do about that? Remember the thinking? The, the ideology says throw them out, get rid of them, because there's differences where we don't want differences. A thinker says maybe there are differences, maybe they aren't. What can we do about that? How can we investigate? How can we know people better? That's the scientific psychological perspective that's healthier rather than the one that says just get rid of them. All right. Uh, one last thing. There is a, a group of people who have been employing strategies to continue eugenics. It's on a different scale though. Eugenics is that idea that you get rid of, right? They had the early uh, 1924, there was these forced sterilization of uh, of people who had mental retardation at the time is what it was called. Um, they would make them incapable of having children. But we got rid of that. That was unjust. 
nowadays what we we find is is sometimes it's done subtly sometimes these genocides uh, of people who have low iqs is done subtly for example a big celebration happened in iceland when they said our country is finally free of down syndrome because what they did is they did prenatal testing and aborted all of the fetuses who had down syndrome down syndrome the trisomy it's a genetic abnormality that one of the consequences, one of the cognitive sequelae of the is IQ that's low, uh, that's in the intellectual disa disability range. But Iceland's gotten rid of all those folks. They don't have them anymore because they aborted, selectively aborted fetuses that had Down syndrome. That's, that's the type of thinking you need to look out for. Not the type of thinking that says there's a difference between groups, but one that says we start judging people based on their scores on a particular group. Folks who have Down syndrome have low IQs, but do you think that that removes their intrinsic human value? That level of thinking I have a problem with. That level of pursuit of ridding our world of people who have an intellectual difference, a diversity of intelligence, that's, that's what leads us to the Nazis. That's what leads us to people who want to remove an entire group of people based on an immutable characteristic about them, whether it's their nationality, their sex, or, or, or their intellectual capacity. You have to be careful about this. Sounds great, right? No more babies with Down syndrome. At the cost of whom? If any of you know somebody with Down syndrome, I want you to think about this right now. Would the world be a better place without them? Every time I think of my friend who I know that has Down syndrome, or the people in my life who I've known that have Down syndrome, it brings a smile to my face because I know what a joy they are to be around. This world's tough. This world's full of nasty and brutish things, as Thomas Hobbes says. But whenever I'm around my friend with Down syndrome, I feel happier. That person brings joy wherever they go. Do you want to remove that, even though that person isn't somebody that I would engage to help me solve the New York Times crossword puzzle? There's something very valuable about diversity. And if, if we start having an attitude where we want to rid ourselves of it, right? Let's get rid of the people who have really low IQ. Or you know what happens often in genocides? What happened in the <laughs> cultural Great Leap Forward in Mao's China? Let's get rid of all the, politi the political geniuses, all those uh, professors that were at the universities teaching our students to think different ideas. You cut off both ends of a curve, that's bad. Cutting off any end of a curve based on an immutable characteristic is bad. But intelligence is a really interesting psychological trait that people have because it's very predictive of their outcomes in certain areas, whether it be education or even relationships. You might think you want to be somebody who's extremely intelligent. But when we actually look at people who have extreme intelligences, while there are advantages, there are also disadvantages. In fact, the more capable you are of these sort of existentially large thoughts about life, about the universe, the more capable you are of being disappointed by your own efficacy in them. And often we find that people with extremely high intelligences suffer depression more. Maybe that's the reason that we see more depression. There's something called the Flynn effect that has said that ever since we've been testing um, IQs for people, we've been seeing sub successive generations get smarter and smarter and smarter. It's the Flynn effect. Literally, our kids are being more intelligent than we are. We're not really sure why, whether that's the context of improved health, improved education, improved vaccination against childhood diseases and all the sort of good stuff that we've done with kids, improve schooling, not having them in sweatshops. Sorry, Bangladesh. Guys, don't buy those clothes from Bangladesh sweatshops. Maybe it's evolution. Maybe it's something that's about how children are growing evolutionarily to adapt to their environment and become more intelligent. Because intelligence is a very adaptive behavior. All right. And be careful when you read about intelligence stuff. Be careful when you take those tests online. Those tests are approximations of, a, of what it would be like to take a test, an in true intelligence test, the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. Be careful when you say that there's something that is 
similar, it doesn't mean that you've done the one thing. Like if you really needed to be a part of Mensa, you can't just go and take the little Facebook IQ test. That doesn't count. You're going to need to take the standardized one, the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. And those cost hundreds of dollars. 